to 1 Timothy chapter 4 for the scripture reading tonight. 1 Timothy chapter 4, and you should have received an outline coming in. And so uh, if you did not, uh, look on with a neighbor, or you could slip back there, or ushers may have one. But we're going to turn to 1 Timothy chapter 4. And I appreciate your prayers as we enter this uh, season. I'll be preaching, of course, tonight, tomorrow morning in chapel. And then, of course, Sunday morning for the Law Enforcement Sunday. That's a very unique kind of a day and message. And Sunday night, we have a big night. And Monday night, I'll be preaching the college graduation. Tuesday, we'll have college board meetings. And there's a lot going on the next seven days. But it all revolves around the Great Commission of Jesus Christ. And so it all excites me. And I'm just thrilled that we can have part in these things, reaching children, teaching college students, and evangelizing our own community all on the same weekend. How awesome and what a great great local church ministry God has given to us uh, to be a part of, and I thank him for it. And so 1 Timothy, I'm going to find it here in just a minute as soon as I stop talking, and I'm holding the microphone tonight, so I'm flipping here with my, my left hand. There we go, 1 Timothy uh, chapter 4. We're going to read beginning in verse number 1. I do want to mention before I read the scriptures that in the back lobby, some things I'm going to mention in the message tonight, I've written a booklet that I would like to make available to our church family. I gave it to the college students as part of their instruction this semester. It's called The Woke Agenda and its influence on churches and colleges in America. You can, uh, you can go ahead and take a snapshot if you'd like to of this, uh, uh, whatever that thing is, that blob of ink up there. What do they call those things? That's what they call them. Some of you are already buying into the Antichrist plan, but go ahead and uh, you can uh, take a picture of the QR code if you want to. But the woke agenda, sometimes people ask, what is that? And it really, uh, unfortunately, is affecting churches that are going apostate. And uh, some of the questions I answer in the book, is Rick Warren biblically accurate to promote female preachers in the mixed assembly? Why does Andy Stanley refer to scripture as clobber passages when they deal with homosexuality? Is social justice another gospel? Is the color of your skin a sin, or is the condition of your heart what matters most? Um, should the First Baptist Church of Orlando and other churches allow openly gay members? Are social works necessary for presenting the gospel? Now, these are real live issues happening in our country today, and we're seeing uh, the erosion many times of of faith and the turning away from faith in churches across the land. And there's about 52 footnotes. And so everything I just said and a whole lot more, and it's all footnoted. And uh, some of you that study the Word of God and you're sensing and wondering what's going on with, uh, with our country, sad to say many churches are not standing where they should and many Christians are not standing where they should. And so if you would like a little more of an addendum to tonight's message, those are available for free in the back and you feel free to pick it up and uh, otherwise we're going to get it right in the scriptures tonight as well. Is everybody ready? All right, 1 Timothy chapter 4 verse 1. Now, the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared with a hot iron forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. For every creature of God is good and nothing to be refused if it be received with thanksgiving. For it is sanctified by the word of God and prayer. If thou put the brethren in remembrance of these things, thou shalt be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished up in the words of faith and of, a, and of good doctrine whereunto thou hast attained but refuse profane and old wives' fables, and exercise thyself, rather, unto godliness. For bodily exercise profiteth little, but godliness is profitable unto all things, having promise of the life that now is, and of that which is to come. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for this time to study your word. And Lord, as we enter into a, a busy weekend, Lord, we're just excited that we can be a part of these great events. We do pray that you would bless in the upcoming weekend, but we pray right now for illumination from your spirit as we study the subject of apostasy and as we see the tragedy of many churches uh, turning away from truth. Help us to be 
vigilant to stand for the truth and to contend for the truth. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Well, as long as there has been doctrine, a set of beliefs from the Word of God given to the local New Testament church, there has also been false doctrine. Satan is a master counterfeiter. Satan is a liar. And so for everything that is good and true created by God, Satan creates a counterfeit. Even back in the Garden of Eden, Satan began questioning and twisting and contradicting the Word of God. And you'll remember the famous words of Satan when he said to Eve, Yea, hath God said. And he questioned the very teachings of the Word of God. You might find that in your notes in Genesis 3, verse 1. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Satan is a liar and a constant questioner of the very revealed word of God. We see it in the beginning of creation. We see it in the beginning of the church history. The Bible says in Acts 15 and verse 1, And certain men which came down from Judea taught the brethren and said, Except ye be circumcised after the manner of Moses, you cannot be saved. No sooner was the gospel presented in a very clear fashion than suddenly came false teaching called Judaism, which was an admixture of the gospel with the law. Hence, there was no true salvation available through works. And so the Bible says in Jude and verse 3, these words, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and to exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. Now, uh, my granddad used to say, the person who stands for nothing will fall for everything. And the Bible says that we're to stand for the truth. We're to contend for the faith. I submit to you that uh, many churches today are losing their will to contend for the faith. They don't want to seem mean. They don't want to seem negative. They don't want, to, uh, they don't want people to view them in, in, in a way that maybe doesn't feel good. And they want to be accepted many times. And yet God commands us uh, not only to believe the truth, but to stand up for the truth of the Word of God. And I am amazed at the very basic things that uh, so-called evangelicals are beginning to turn away from. Even things such as a literal creation are now being denied in circles that we never thought would deny them. And so as we come to the Word of God, we must approach it as it is, the Word of God. We must receive it, stand for it, and even contend for it. One Sunday school teacher asked the class, who can tell me what false doctrine is? Who can tell me what false doctrine is? And a little boy raised his hand, he raised his hand, he said, it's when the doctor gives the wrong stuff to the people who are sick. Now you gotta think about it phonetically, false doctrine, but some of you will get it later. Now, false doctrine, let me tell you something. As bad as it would be for a doctor to give the wrong medicine to someone that is sick, I believe it is even worse for a church to give false doctrine. We must stay true to the Word of God. Now, the church has always had to fight false doctrine. And by way of introduction, some of you have studied some of the early doctrinal errors of the church. There was something known as Gnosticism that entered into church life around the second century. Uh, Gnosticism taught that Jesus appeared uh, to be a man, uh, but that uh, God really uh, could not manifest in that way. Uh, that God was only reachable, according to the Gnostics, through a hierarchy of angels. And, and uh, they diminished the deity of Jesus Christ with such teachings. Uh, there was, in the 4th century, uh, a group called uh, the uh, Arians with Arianism. They taught that Jesus was a created lower God, a lower level deity, and uh, that the Holy Spirit is only a force of God, not a person of the Godhead. And so they denied the uh, personhood of the Holy Spirit of God. In the 5th century, there was uh, Pelagianism, which uh, said that we do not inherit 
a sin nature from Adam uh, or righteousness from Christ, that we can live a good life by ourselves uh, and that we can attain salvation without Jesus Christ. During the Dark Ages, there was a false church that rose to worldwide prominence. We speak of it today as Catholicism. And Catholicism uh, began to teach that commoners like us were not allowed to read and interpret the Bible, did not need to own a Bible. During the Dark Ages, the Catholics burned millions of Bibles. And sometimes we wonder why there are not more copies of certain texts and, and so forth. And it's literally because of the Dark Ages and the destruction of the Word of God by the Roman Catholic Church. They taught salvation by works. They taught uh, that you could in, involve yourself in the purchase of indulgences. And if you sinned, particular sins, you could pay the church a certain amount of money and have your sins uh, forgiven. And really, those false teachings became the precipitation uh, just prior to the Reformation when certain early church uh, reformers, such as Luther, such as Huss, began to stand up and say, wait a minute, you can't tell us that we can pay for our sins with money. You can only pay for sins by the blood of Jesus Christ. And so wherever there is truth uh, proclaimed, there is truth denied. And so it really in some ways should not shock us when we hear about modern day apostates because there have always been those turning away from the truth. Now the Bible tells us very clearly tonight that the last times will be especially marked by apostasy. And so we need to get our mind geared up for this. We need to be a people that aren't so shocked when someone that we thought was a preacher or a teacher of the Bible denies certain doctrine. Notice what it says in our text tonight. 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 1. Now the Spirit, by the way, that's capital S, the Holy Spirit. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly. Now let me ask you a question tonight. How many of you believe that the Bible is a God-breathed book? Amen? The Spirit of God has given us, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. But this verse always just grabs me for some reason because it says, The Spirit speaketh expressly. It's, it's an emphasis that's given to us as if to say, don't miss this. The Spirit is giving this expressly that in the latter times, men shall depart, some shall depart from the faith. Now, it's one thing to hear that in the latter times, people will not listen to the faith or believe the faith. That's somewhat understandable. But to know it, to handle it, and to depart from it, how tragic. In the latter times, some shall depart from the faith. 2 Thessalonians 2 says it this way, verse 3, Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day, speaking of the coming of our Lord, that day shall not come except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed the son of perdition. We know this verse speaks about the Antichrist, Prior to the revelation of the Antichrist, there is going to be a falling away. And the word here is apostasia. It means a defection. It means a forsaking. There is going to be a falling away of truth. And I believe you already see this in mainline denominations. I was speaking to my youngest son yesterday, and he was asking me some history of conservative Baptist, General Regu Association of Regular Baptists, American Baptists. I said, son, let me tell you, the American Baptists were ordaining homosexuals way many years ago. 30 years ago, they were turning away from the truth. 30 years ago, they were questioning the miracles of the Bible. What was I telling him? 30 years ago, the apostasy had begun in the Northern Baptist Convention. The apostasy has been well underway in the United Methodist Church for many years uh, since they have denied so many major doctrines, including in many of their churches, the blood atonement of Jesus Christ, and in most of their churches, the doctrine of marriage between a man and a woman. It is apostasy as they turn away from the truth. And the Bible says that before the Antichrist is going to be able to have this sway over the masses, one of the first things that will happen is that churches, the salt and light in this world, are going to turn away from the truth. They are going to apostatize. And we're finding today fewer and fewer courageous churches, courageous pastors who are willing to say the truth. And we'll be challenging our graduates this weekend, no doubt, to stand in this compromising day for the truth. And so we must understand what's going on. 
Uh, Pew Research uh, came out with a demographic study a few years ago stating, and I quote, virtually every Christian group has declined, including evangelicals. And he went on to say uh, that uh, the decline has increased uh, from 16% to 23% in just the last eight years. For those under 30 years old, 36% of them said that they no longer were intent interested in the faith they once held. You can find these studies in Pew Research basically saying that there's a turning away, there's a falling away that is definitive in the uh, Christian world today. Now, I think any of you hearing me say these words, if, if, if you have the Spirit of God within your heart, there ought to be something within you saying, I don't want to be a part of that trend. I don't want to be a part of some falling away from my Lord. I want to be faithful to my Lord. We don't build these buildings so that some liberal preacher someday will stand up here and say there's many ways to heaven. No, no, no. We want this pulpit always to be declaring that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. These things matter to us, and we think in terms of keeping the, the ministry strong and to developing a strong leadership. And uh, I had uh, three or four really important and, and, and helpful meetings uh, uh, this past weekend. I never like being away from Lancaster Baptist. But, you know, one of, the, one of the things that I think is true is the fact that we need to give some young 38, 40, 42-year-old men sometimes an opportunity to stand up and declare the truth as well. We need to raise up men who are not ashamed to tell their generation what the Bible says. Now, if we want to have that kind of a life and that kind of a church, what are some things that we must remember? Let's dig into this quickly tonight. First, I want you to see the description of apostasy. What is apostasy? The description of apostasy. We find it here in verse number one. It is a fatal departure. A fatal departure. The Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith. The word expressly says this is clear. It is in direct terms. There will be those that depart, which means literally to remove themselves from, to declare that they want no attachment with the, the truth of God's word. By the way, sometimes we say, well, so-and-so just quit going to church. Can I tell you, it's oftentimes much deeper than that. Because those that just quit the church normally aren't finding another red-hot Bible-believing church. They're finding nothing because they didn't just leave the church. They left the faith. And, and sometimes we're very gullible. Well, you know, they still have a fish bumper sticker on their car. And, well, you know, they still pray the rosary or whatever in the world they might do. And we, wanna, we want to hope that they still believe in God. And we do hope that they still believe in God. But in reality, many times there's no fruit. There's no sign of that, that they have left the faith. Some, the Bible says some will depart from the faith. These people once had sound doctrine, but now they have departed from the truth. Now, apostasy isn't an unintentional departure or personal struggle with doubt. It is deliberately abandoning the truth for erroneous teaching. The faith refers specifically to the body of Christian doctrine, not the act of believing. All right? Let me say that again. The faith, departing from the faith, is speaking about the body of truth. It's not, it's not speaking about the act of believing. It's speaking about turning away from the book that we're preaching tonight. Some will depart from the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. People who understand and outwardly affirm Christian doctrine but don't have a heart for God are prime candidates for being seduced by demons away from their faith. In other words, what I'm saying here, it is vital that we not only know the book of God, but that we know the God of the book. It's vital that we know that I need thee every hour. Oh, it's vital that we know we need the Lord as much as we also need the truth of the Lord. And so it's important to keep a tender heart for God. Uh, I think of so many who have apostatized in, uh, in recent years. I think of this, uh, this phenom group out of Australia, Hillsong is their name. And there were a few songs that came out of there that were kind of mostly scripture. The melody, wasn't, well, the melody was fine. But most of what they came out with, there's a Netflix series that, that documents this so well, was literally copying rock and roll music. And they said it with their own mouths. They said all we were trying to do is copy the beat, copy the scene, copy the whole situation so that we could sell, sell, sell. 
a United Pentecostal Church in Australia and uh, just became incredibly, incredibly popular. But then things began to come apart. And I don't even have time to declare all the lawsuits and all the accusations of pedophilia. It's amazing. And we ought to pray for them. And I'm not gloating in it. But here's the point I want to make about Hillsong. One of their lead songwriters, Marty Sampson, was his name, said, and I quote, I am leaving my faith. He put it out on Twitter. He didn't just leave his church. He left his faith. He just walked away from Christianity. Someone who wrote songs that people sing. I'll tell you one thing. We're not singing that man's songs in this church. Look at I want to sing the songs of someone who's loving their faith, not leaving their faith. And what I want you to understand is when, when you hear about a preacher or a songwriter or whatever who left their faith, what you ought to say is, God's Word said that would happen. It shouldn't shake us. Like, oh, what's happening? And it's not that we should rejoice in it. But God's word said there will be a what first? A what? Falling away. And that word is apostasia. So it is a fatal departure. It's a sad thing. And I'm going to tell you something. I don't care if it's an independent Baptist, a Pentecostal, or whoever it is that says I'm leaving my faith. That is a sad statement when that is made. When someone says I'm leaving my faith, it's a fatal departure. And secondly, it involves false doctrine. Now, whether it's the doctrine of self, whether it's uh, some other philosophy of science, it always involves false doctrine. Notice what it says in verse number one again. It says, they shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and the doctrine of devils. Seducing spirits means to wander or lead astray. It means misleading, leading into error, corrupt, deceiver. Doctrines of devils means against Christ. Both of these descriptions speak of evil spirits and devils. Now make no mistake, the moving away of so many who once sang in the choir, Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound, and now two years later, uh, their fingernails are black, their lipstick is black, their entire dress is black, they're tattooing their body, and we're not going to stand around and say, but they just still love Jesus so much. I hate to say it tonight, but the fact is that they are leaving the faith. They are under a dark demonic influence if they were saved I'm not saying they can be inhabited by a demon but I'm telling you tonight that it is a sad thing when someone the Bible says the Spirit speaketh expressly that they will depart from the faith how does that happen pastor they begin to give heed to seducing spirits might be an atheistic billboard might be a talk radio show might be as we saw so prolifically during uh, during COVID people on the internet Challenging all the things that relate to God, even the basic things of, of male and female are under attack. Where does that all come from? It comes from the pit of hell. 1 John 4, 1. Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they be of God. Because there are many false prophets gone out in the world. Would you read that with me together, folks? You need to get this. Notice what it says, 1 John 4, 1. It's in your notes. Ready to begin. Beloved, believe not... Try the spirits. This speaks of discernment. Listen, a lot of times someone will get discouraged, they'll feel depressed, and it's amazing what begins to pop up on their social media. It's amazing what pops up on a screen. It's amazing what someone hears on the radio. What is that? Try the spirits. You better try that on the radio. You better try that on social media against the Word of God because there are many false prophets, the Bible says who know, it seems like the devil knows when a Christian is discouraged and begins to throw this false teaching in their way. So remember a couple of things about this false doctrine. Number one, Satan is a deceiver. Satan is a deceiver, 2 Corinthians eleven thirteen. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ, and no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Someone says, how, how can the whole world one day follow the Antichrist? I think they're going to be pretty primed by then. We see already people following all kinds of false teaching and all types of false religion. Satan will deceive them. Satan is behind the false doctrine even today. And then Satan is a destroyer, 1 Peter 5, 8. Be vigilant, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, has a roaring lion, seeketh whom he may devour. We don't have time to go all into Ephesians 6, but this is why God says, put on the armor of God. 
Why? Because there's a spiritual battle. There's a battle for your mind. There's a battle for your spiritual heart. There is a battle every single day. And we must put on the armor of God if we're going to stand against the wiles of the devil. The description of apostasy is pretty clear. That some will depart from the faith. Now there are some people who stop coming to church for a while and they're going through a trial, they're going through sickness, they're going through a work schedule. And then the Spirit of God draws them back, sometimes maybe in a spirit of repentance, sometimes maybe just they, they're, they're staying really involved on live stream, they're reading the Word of God, they're, they're doing fairly well spiritually. And, and thank the Lord for that. But I'm telling you, someone who apostatizes, this is someone who's openly stating, I don't believe that stuff anymore. I don't believe that Jesus is the only way. I don't believe that stuff uh, that the Bible says. And oh, what a tragedy. The description of apostasy is a falling away from the truth. And folks, we don't want to get close to that ledge. We want to stay far away from that ledge. Guard your heart, for out of it are the issues of life. All right, let's notice, secondly, we see the description of apostasy. It's a falling away. Secondly, let's look at the danger of apostasy. Several dangers are listed here. First, verse 2, speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. The first thing we see in the apostate life is false messages, false messages, religious lies. And this refers specifically to teaching falsehoods. Uh, it speaks of lies and then hypocrisy, false answers uh, to pretend to be one thing but actually being another. The cults are great at this. The cults always say, oh, we believe in God. And by the way, they'll always say they believe in Jesus. Even as they are teaching uh, a false and damnable doctrine, uh, according to verse number two, they're speaking lies in hypocrisy. When they say that they love Jesus, it is a lie. They don't even know Jesus. And so Acts chapter 20 says it this way, verse 28, Take heed therefore unto yourselves and, and unto all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock, also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. So Paul says, listen, I'm warning you because after I leave, I know these false teachers are going to be around. And they're going to pop in. They're going to be in the church, outside of the church. And, and Paul was warning them. Spurgeon said, it is a remarkable fact that all the heresies which have arisen in the Christian church have, been decided, ha have had a decided tendency to dishonor God and to flatter man. And I find that to be a very true statement. So there is religious lies. And secondly, there's a re there are rejectors of the truth. Now notice in verse 2, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. Let's say that together. Having their... This indicates that these false teachers have had encounters with God. They've had times maybe where they've been to a church service. They've been to a crusade, a revival meeting. Their conscience was affected, but the more they said no to God, the more their conscience was seared, and the more the conscience is seared, the less the ability to feel. And so the Bible says that these false teachers, they're not, listen, they're not uh, people that have never had the opportunity, and you can study whether it's uh, Karl Marx or Adolf Hitler, you're going to find that many of the worst atheists and demonic people in world history attended Sunday schools. They knew about the truth, but their conscience was seared. In fact, Ephesians 4.19 says, Who being past feeling have given themselves over unto lasciviousness to work all uncleanness with, with, uh, uh, with greediness. Their past feeling to the point that they accept false messages. Uh, 2 Timothy 2 speaks of this. To the point that they make false professions. Uh, some, there may be that, uh, that were never saved. Uh, obviously, some perhaps were saved and then they walk away uh, and as was the case with Demas who having loved this present world walked away from the Apostle Paul. But I think a verse that really explains this apostasy is found in 1 John 2.19 and I think it's in your notes. Is that one in your notes? Let's look at what it says. They went out from us 
but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest that they were not all of us. Now, I've heard people use this verse in a lot of different contexts, but I think you're very safe in the context of saying that the only thing that really implies of us in the sense of the body life is that someone is in Christ, someone that is saved. And what we're seeing here is that some people go out from among us because they were not ever truly of us in the sense of being in Christ. The only reason that we're connected tonight, help me out here, is because of Jesus. That's the only thing that connects us, is that we're brothers and sisters in Christ, right? Uh, we're of one another, the Bible says. Christ is in us, we're in Christ, we're of one another, uh, we're a band of brothers. There's different terms you can use. But John says there were some that went out from them because they were not ever of them. Now that's a scary thing. There can be someone in your connection group, someone in this church, that is among us but not of us. And John says some of those that had gone out from among them were never of them spiritually. Friend, make sure that you're saved. And make sure that, listen, when people come forward to join our church, we don't try to make it hard. But I've spent 37 years training our deacons on questions to ask when we're receiving members. And, and they might come to us, listen, this is what I say to the deacons. If they come and say, I'm from the First Baptist Church of Wichita, that's wonderful. But we still ask them some basic questions. When did you accept Jesus Christ as your Savior? Tell us your testimony. Because you can be a member of First Baptist Church of Wichita. You can be, you can be among them but not be of them. Being from a church does not mean you're saved. So we ask them, tell us how you got saved. And boy, if someone comes forward to this church and we said, how did you get saved? They say, well, I'll tell you, last year I was in a hospital and I'll tell you what, it got so cold in that room, so cold, and the nurse was so loud. And then all of a sudden I looked at the end of the bed and there was a glowing light. And I knew it was God. I just knew it. And, and ever since then, I'm on my way to heaven. Anybody in here discerning enough to know that that's not what salvation is? It could have been too much pepperoni pizza for dinner. I have no idea what it was. But that, my friend, is not salvation. And I'm telling you, there are churches that would hear such a testimony and say, well, praise the Lord. Not mention the name of the church tonight. I mentioned it two or three weeks ago in the sense of some music they published. But they literally baptized a lady last Sunday night. And they said, tell us your testimony before you're baptized. She said, here's my testimony. God's called me to help save rescue dogs all over the world. And that's why I'm here tonight to get baptized. Folks, number one, that's not salvation. Number two, that's nothing to do with baptism. Number three, I don't know that God has a specific calling for saving rescue dogs. There might be a higher calling in life than that. There's nothing wrong with saving rescue dogs, but it's not going to get you to heaven. Somebody help me here tonight. I'm telling you there are churches that are completely apostate. I mean, that woman said that, and they all jumped around and waved their hands and closed their eyes and acted like it was the greatest revelation, and they baptized her. I don't, look at as long as I'm the pastor of this church, I want to do my very best to know that someone coming into the membership is truly saved. They're truly saved. John says the reason they went out from among, the, uh, from among us is because they never were of us. So there's a false message there that leads to a false profession. Now notice letter B, the false doctrine, the false doctrine, the danger of apostasy. And I know this message, if you're a new Christian, might seem a little strong, but I'm going to tell you there'll be a day when you'll say, I'm glad I heard that message. Because you're going to be hearing, look it, you can read this book. You can see the footnotes in it. But you're going to be hearing more and more of people who start compromising the truth of God's word. Now notice uh, verse 3. Forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats, which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. Now there were many false doctrines that, that Paul is warning Timothy about. And first century Greek philosophy was very dualistic. All, all matter was evil and all spirit was good. That's kind of what they taught. Matter is evil, spirit is good. Thus, anything that would please anyone's physical life 
in many circles of the first century was taught as evil. And, and so here we see a couple of them. First, we see kind of an interesting phrase, forbidding to marry, right? You thought we had standards at the Bible college. Here's one for you. Forbidding, no, we have the opposite here. Uh, some of you deadbeats, get married, but that's another, that's another sermon sometime, all right? But there were those that were forbidding, they were forbidding to marry. This fell back to Gnosticism. The Gnostics felt that physical relationship or pleasure hindered spiritual growth. And so they took a position against marriage. Hence, they were false teachers because God says things in his Bible like what God hath joined together, let no man put asunder. And God very much is the originator of marriage, which is why we preach messages in the defense of Christian marriage, because God ordained it. That's why men hate it, because God ordained it. That's why people want to have uh, surgery to change themselves, because it's, they're not mad at me. They're not mad at this church. They are angry at God. God created male and female. God created marriage. But concerning marriage, these Gnostic groups said, don't even do it. And then the second one is concerning meat. Now, some of you are like, I can live without my woman, but not my steak. Now, that's meddling right there, preacher, telling me you can't eat meat. Now, I know some of you. I know, I know your address. So notice what it says, forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats. Now, come on. Imagine if I preached against In-N-Out Burger. Some of you would leave this church. You would go out from among us because you were never of us. All right, just checking to see where you are theologically there for a minute, okay? But this is what was going on. They imposed dietary restrictions. God created food to be received thankfully. And Paul summarized it in one passage, 1 Corinthians 10, 31. Whether therefore you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do it how? To the glory of God, right? And we know in Romans 14, we know in other passages, there, was, there is a place for not being a stumbling block and not partaking of uh, meats that were offered unto idols and so forth and being conscious of the weaker brethren. But Paul uh, is addressing to Timothy here uh, the false teachings that, that abounded by these apostate teachers. They were uh, legalistic in the sense they taught you had to uh, conform to these uh, rituals in order to somehow please God. And uh, they taught that salvation was not by grace, it was somehow through merit. And this is why Paul said in Galatians 1, 6, he said, I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. You see, this is, this is what it means to apostatize. It is to know the truth, to receive the truth, and to turn to a completely different gospel, whether it's the gospel itself, whether it's a social gospel, whatever it is, it's another gospel. Notice verse 7, Galatians 1, which is not another, but there be some that would trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. Now listen to this. But though we or an angel from heaven, if even if you've ever studied Mormonism, it was the angel Moroni that appeared to Joseph Smith and gave him his whole religious concept. But the Bible's kind of clear. Though we are an angel from heaven preach another gospel unto you than that which, you, which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again. If any man preach any other gospel unto you that ye have received, let him be accursed. This is the danger of apostasy. And we must hold to the truth of the gospel, to the purity of Jesus, to the purity of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. And we must be aware that there are many who are saying Jesus is not all you need. There are many who are saying that he's not the only way of salvation, even in what were considered at one time soundly fundamental denominations or churches. So we see the description of apostasy. It's the falling away. The danger of apostasy is that people will hold to another gospel, that they will cleave to false doctrine and turn away from Jesus Christ. Then let's notice thirdly, the defeat of apostasy. The defeat of apostasy. Now again, as I said in the introduction, nobody in here tonight should want to ever apostatize, nor should you ever want someone in your Sunday school class to apostatize, or your family, or this church. I mean, we know that there are churches in New England, and some of you have seen them, that were once bastions of truth. These are churches where great revivals were preached. These are churches where great preachers preached the Word of God. The great awakenings took place. And today, they're completely given over to pluralism, humanism, all kinds of isms. Many of them 
have a, a very weakened leadership structure in the sense of doctrinal positions held by those leaders. And it's tragic. I've seen churches that are now coffee shops. I've seen churches that are bed and breakfasts. I've seen churches that are uh, all kinds of things except a church. And I want us to see tonight, how do you defeat the very encroachment of this? Verse number six. If thou put the brethren in remembrance of these things, thou shalt be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourish up in the words of faith and of good doctrine, whereunto thou hast attained. The first thing that we must have is we must have the remembrance of truth. We must remember the truth. I'll speak as your pastor, and I love our church. I've been a little bit burdened since we have come back, and we may have Sunday school classes again. If, they, if you can have a Sunday school class on a Wednesday, we may try that again sometime. It, there were nice things about the scheduling of that. and not, There's not a doctrine that tells you when you have these classes or services. But one of the things I've noticed is we came back to Sunday school, which has been great for our adults, connection groups, but some of our folks that were doing well on Wednesday have not been back. And I love them. Some of them might be watching on live stream right now. That's wonderful. But I want to tell you what I believe firmly. I believe in so much the more as you see the day approaching. I believe we need Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night. I believe we need preaching. I believe we need to be in the Word of God as much as we can. And I'm not saying if someone misses a Wednesday night service that they're an apostate. Please don't misunderstand me. But I'm saying this. That Paul told Timothy, if you want to defeat apostasy, notice this in, in verse 6, you've got to put the brethren in remembrance of these things. They need to remember. The word remembrance means to place under. Uh, it would be like our phrase, we need to get under the preaching. If we're going to avoid apostasy, we need to stay under the preaching. Right? We need to stay under the Word of God. It's vital because there's these reminders and these warnings like we heard tonight. They went out from among us because they were not of us. That's kind of wakes you up a little bit. The Word of God will keep us going until Jesus comes if we'll stay in the Word of God. But we must be put in remembrance. And that's why we have Wednesday night service because we need to be put into remembrance of what's going on in this world. And you can't have enough of it. We need the Word of God. And so uh, here he speaks of the words of faith and of good doctrine. Now listen, good preaching is not just five good stories connected. Preaching is kind of funny and sometimes it's humbling. Sometimes the last thing a preacher wants to do is stand in the back and say, so what'd you get out of the message today? Because I'm gonna tell you sometimes what people get. That was a funny joke you told in point three there, you know. And sometimes illustrations and jokes, you know, they're fine. But what matters is the doctrine. What matters is the truth. And some of you men and women ought to be sitting in every one of these services saying, God, give me a dominant truth here because I need it to hold on to. I need the word. I need to know what the Bible says. And so we must remember. He says, put them into remembrance. Uh, and then notice in verse 6 it says, if thou, be, if thou put the brethren in remembrance of these things, thou shalt be a good minister of Jesus Christ. And it goes on to say, uh, nourished up in the words of faith and of good doctrine, whereunto thou hast attained. Notice a few of these words here. The word faith, uh, pistis, it means a set of beliefs. Say that with me. A set of we need to be nourished up in our faith. Now, some of you might say, well, I'm not a theologian. I'm not a preacher. Why do I have to be nourished in the faith? Because you're a Christian. You need to know the doctrine of the Word of God, nourished in the faith. And then it goes on, and it uses the word doctrine. It is the word didaskalia. It, it, it speaks of biblical instruction. Biblical instruction. And then it says in verse number 630, nourished up in the words of faith and good doctrine, whereunto thou hast attained. He's saying you've already understood some of this, but you need to keep being reminded of it. As it says in Colossians 2, 7, rooted and built up and established in the faith. John 17, 17, Jesus said, Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. So we need the word of the truth of the word of God. Now again, there, I think of some of the recent apostates uh, in, the, in Christendom. Uh, one, several years ago, quite well known by the name of Rob Bell, who apostatized. 
He began to look at the scriptures as inspirational but not inspired. He said, and I quote, I think culture is already there and the church will continue to be even more irrelevant when it quotes letters from 2,000 years ago as their best defense. Now, this is a preacher saying that if we preach this book, we're going to become irrelevant. This is a preacher of a community church, John Wimber, a vineyard pastor. It was amazing and astounding to me when I found out that God could communicate outside of the scriptures. By the way, you be careful of guys getting communication outside of the scriptures. Folks, I've been here 37 years. I have not yet preached every book of, I've not preached every word of this book. And, and when I do get done, if God lets me get every word of this book, we'll start over in some more of the Word of God because even as I'm seeing the book of Romans, God's already given me so much more there than when I preached through and read through many, many years ago. I'm going to tell you something. We don't need revelation from outside of this book. What these apostate preachers need to realize is that whether it was 2,000 years ago or whether I read it right now, it doesn't change. It's God's revealed word. 1 Peter 1 23, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. The word of God liveth and abideth forever. The word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. It's alive, folks. I'm going to tell you something. Again, the apostate knows that. They're running from it. They're denying it. They're, they're blaming their sixth grade school teacher on why they left church. They're, they're blaming the bad experience at camp. They'll have all these other things. But I'm going to tell you something. The word of God is alive and they know it. They're just choosing not to believe it. We must remember the truth. I love this phrase. This book is the mind of God, the state of man, the way of salvation, the doom of sinners, and the happiness of believers. Its doctrines are holy. Its precepts are binding. Its histories are true. Its decisions are immutable. Read it to be wise. Believe it to be safe. Practice it to be holy. We've never done this yet, but I'm telling you, if we ever had a graduate from West Coast who denied the gospel, the blood, the book, now, some of them do squirrely things that make me feel uncomfortable, but I'm telling you, if we ever had one that denied the doctrines of the Word of God, I wouldn't hesitate one minute to ask for their diploma back. I don't want to associate with someone who's saying, this 2,000-year-old book is irrelevant. Listen, we want to graduate students this coming Monday night who believe the Bible's the inerrant, infallible Word of God who are going to stand up and proclaim it to their generation. We didn't create this college to train up apostates. But there are many who are apostatizing. Remember the truth. And then the second thing you can do, and we can do as a church, is remove from false doctrine. Remove or separate from false doctrine. Verse 7. But refuse. All right, everybody say that word with me. Refuse. Say it again. Refuse. Profane and old wives' tables and exercise thyself rather into godliness. So refuse means to shun. Have you learned in your life how to shun somebody that's divisive or doctrinally impure? Say, well, I just believe in loving everybody I know, and you're going to rescue dogs. I get it. I get it. <laughs> but wait a minute. Somebody that's speaking ill of your Jesus is not somebody that you need to have in for tea. There's a biblical doctrine of shunning someone who is adamantly attacking your Christ. Shun those, and, and notice it doesn't just say wives' tables, it says refuse profane, profane meaning unholy, fables meaning myths. Stay away from people that want to come in and tell you about the angel Moroni and tell you about Ellen G. White and tell you about whatever other kind of occultic practice they're involved in. God says, look it, you can love them, you can preach Christ to them, but to bring them in and entertain them and let them speak to you all of these anti-Christian doctrines, no, 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 no. That's not what God wants you to do with your time and with your energy. Second John uh, chapter, uh, Second John, uh, rather, verse 10, if there come any unto you and bring not this doctrine, speaking of the doctrine of Jesus, Receive him not into your house, but bid him Godspeed for he that neither bid him Godspeed for he that biddeth him Godspeed is partaker of his evil deeds. In other words, deeds. In other words, don't bring him into the house. Don't say God bless you. You're doing a good work. And there's a lot of that that goes on in the ecumenical movement. Oh, this guy's one of the best 
Muslims I've ever met, and this, this, this one here is great at this or that. There's a lot of this accolades like this. And God says, when someone is attacking the truth of Jesus, don't elevate them. Now, there might be a day this Sunday where we have some folks coming in. We're going to honor our police officers because the Bible furthermore commands us to give honor to whom honor is due. And we want to give honor maybe to some police officers. And some of them aren't going to be saved, I'm sure. By the way, how many of you hope some of them get saved? Yeah. Right? Well, I'm not going to have some guy come up here and talk to us about, tell us your opinion about God if he's not even saved. Remember years ago, I'm going to hurry, I know it's I have just a few more thoughts here, but we had a guest on similar day. I think it was 25th anniversary. And uh, he was the city attorney from Los Angeles. He came in late. He had a plaque for the anniversary. Someone said, yeah, he's a nice guy. Just let him greet the church. And long story short, some of you were here. He got up. Some of you might remember. He said, it's great to be here at Lancaster Baptist. He says, when I'm here at Lancaster Baptist, it just reminds me of the words of Allah. And he starts saying something from the Quran. And I was sitting right over here, and I just started to die. There were a lot of guest preachers, and I could just see them going to Twitter just right during church, you know. Apostasy at Lancaster Baptist or something. I'm like, what is the guy saying, you know? And I remember our mayor came up, and he was going to say, give us a plaque. And I shook his hand, and I said, Rex, you better fix that. And he didn't fix it at all. It was just a bad. And then we had lunch, and so here I was with all the guests at lunch. And would you know that the person they put right next to me was that guy? Man, I tell you, he sat there, and I just, I just wasn't having a happy spirit. I just thought, how could you be that dumb? How could you say that at a Baptist, a Baptist church? It wasn't even politically smart to say that. And, um, and then about halfway through that lunch, the Lord started putting a burden on my heart for him. And the Lord said to my heart, what do you expect an unsafe guy to say? Now, the Lord didn't say it audibly. He just said it to my heart. But I was convicted. Terry can tell you, we stood out here till the evening service. Church started at 5. We stood right out in the parking lot till 445 trying to lead that man to Christ. He didn't get saved. I kept writing him letters, sent him little booklets, kept inviting him to come. One day he came to church. And um, it was on a Sunday when I was preaching just straight on giving, tithing and offerings and such. And, uh, and he just sat there and listened to all of it. By the way, unsaved people think we're supposed to tithe. It's just the Christians want to argue about it. Just, I found that out a long time ago. <laughs> and um, we took that man and his wife up to have a bite to eat. And uh, his, name, his, his, his nickname is Nugent. Honey, I can't remember his first name. Do you remember? I just remember his nickname right now. But anyways, he'll come back to me. And we sat there, and we ate, and we talked about things. And after a while, I said to him, I said, you know, I've been praying for you for several weeks. Here he was, city attorney of Los Angeles. I don't know how many attorneys work for him. Played football for USC. He began to weep, and he said, you'll never know how much that means. And I said, I've been praying that you would be able to know for sure that Jesus Christ is your Savior and heaven is your home. I said, would you let me open the Bible and show you what that really means? And so we did. And about 30 minutes later, he prayed and he got saved. His wife said, you know, I got saved several years ago listening to Christian radio and said, my husband's visited several churches in his career, but this is the only one that ever told him what I heard on the radio that day about how to get saved. He sends me now Christmas cards and we stay in touch. He may be here Sunday. He's been invited. But what I'm telling you is this, we cannot expect the unsaved to speak the truth, but we must never apostatize from the truth. We must remember the truth, we must remove from false doctrine, and then let her see, and we're done, we must repeat the process. <laughs> you mean go to church again? Yep. <laughs> remember the truth again and again and again and again, because like me, sometimes you'll forget a word or a name. You got to get back to the Word of God. Remember the truth, remove false doctrine, and then repeat the process. Look at verse 7. But refuse profane and old wives' uh, t fables, and exercise thyself unto godliness. For bodily exercise profit little, but, but godliness but godliness is profitable unto all things. Now look, I'm, gonna, I'm not an expert on exercise. I can tell you that for sure. But I know this much. Exercising one time, you don't lose 10 pounds. 
You don't have a physique like this with one exercise routine a month. <laughs> if you're going to have good health or if you're going to have this strong physique, you're probably going to exercise over and over again. Do you know what the Bible's saying right there? If you want to be a strong Christian, you better stay in the Word. You better keep exercising daily unto godliness, remembering the truth of the Word of God. That's an interesting word there in verse 8, exercise. It is the word gymnazo. It means to vigorously work it out. It means to stay in God's Word. And I know how busy you all are, but let me tell you something. We need God's Word every day. We need to be in church as often as we can, holding fast the form of sound words. I don't understand all of the subtleties of apostasy. I've tried to share some tonight. But I believe the first step probably is a choice to not listen to the Word of God. The very first incremental step in apostasy is when someone's checking the scores during church. Someone's doing their budget during chapel. Someone in the Christian school is thinking more about a boy or a girl. The first step to apostasy begins with not hearing this word. Now, where all it goes from there and how someone receives whatever they get off of the Internet or some other crazy book they read from Borders Bookstore or wherever, whatever trash can it came from, but apostasy is going to start when you stop hearing the word. It is your first step away from the faith. And I want to encourage you this summer, stay hungry for God's word. Bodily exercise profiteth little, but we must have the Word of God. And so may we, may we do our very best this summer to draw closer to Him and avoid the apostasy of the hour. Let's stand together and let us pray. Father, we thank You for this time to hear this Bible study. And Lord, we pray that You would help us to humbly and diligently avoid the apostasy that's taking place in many places today, even places we never thought possible. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. There might be someone say, wow, tonight the Lord has shown me that I don't need to be turning off the preaching in my mind. I don't need to be shunning the attending in my heart or in the reality of my presence. I need to pursue God or I could feel the tragic effects of apostasy. Maybe you'll never fully apostatize and deny the faith. Maybe not. But it could happen. And I wonder tonight who'd say, Pastor, God spoke to me. I want to fight that tendency. I want to be found remembering the truth, not running away from the truth. Pray for me. Would you lift your hand tonight if God spoke to you in this Bible study? Some of you college students, no doubt the devil's going to throw every kind of a trick towards you this summer to get you away from the faith. Church family, the same. The piano is going to play. If God spoke to your heart, I want to invite you to come right now. If you lifted your hand and just say, Lord, I want to pursue you. I want to pursue your word. I don't want to fall away. I want to stay faithful. If God speak in your heart, you just take a moment tonight. Satan's going to try to get you distracted. If you do not know Jesus Christ as your Savior, if you're not sure you're a Christian, you can just come right up here to the front. Just look at me and I'll see you there and I'll come and talk with you. We'll help you to know how you can be a Christian. There's folks here that will talk with you. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, Thank you, Lord, for warnings like this passage here in 1 Timothy chapter 4. Help us to hear it and to heed it. And Father, we'll thank you for this time tonight. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.